to go and help yourselves to coffee or whatever. But just to uh, kind of orientate you again, we, uh, last time we talked about physical and emotional. We just talked about the volitional now. We're now going to talk about the thinking area. All of it leads towards description. And he's going to get us back. Uh, um, our goal in going into this circle, our aim, um, is to um, understand how our thinking has become distorted and help you to perhaps see ways in which your thinking may have become distorted so that it can be corrected. Um, scripture says, next slide, uh, there should be another slide before this one. And hopefully I can quote it. Um, do not be conformed the to the pattern of this world, but be, tra be, be transformed. transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay. And there's also a scripture in Romans, I can't remember, I think it's chapter 2, where it says that um, man's thinking became uh, darkened. They were darkened in their thinking. Um, and th thinking that they were wise, they actually became fools. So um, there are certain factors that have contributed to this darkened thinking and the fact that we often get our thinking distorted. And the first one there is uh, the fall. And the second one is observation of others. And the third one is our interpretation of the hurts and the traumas that we have suffered in our lives. Let's have a look at um, how the fall has contributed to our foolish or darkened thinking. Um, what was going on there when Adam and Eve fell into sin? What aspects of thinking were involved um, in that fall? They questioned God's goodness. Yes. They. What did Satan say to, to Eve? Did he really say? Did he really say? Yes, did God really say that you would die? You won't die. And so it, it was in the mind that this whole thing began to unfold. And it was the belief that God was actually holding out on them. God knows that when you eat that fruit, you're going to become all wise. You'll be like God. You'll know right from wrong and good from evil, and you'll be like him. And so in their mind, they began this journey, basically, of striking out independent from God. Um, and we commit the same sin, actually. We still have that fallenness in our nature, which is constantly want to try and be independent of God, not be dependent on Him for our needs, striking out <coughs> independent, we believe that life can be found in something other than God. Um, so that is uh, how our thinking has been corrupted, a bit of a summary of that. Um, there are two basic wrong beliefs. Basically, that I can satisfy my own needs apart from God and that I can make life work for myself. Those are two basic wrong beliefs. So, um, let me give you an example. I'm just trying to think of an example. Can you think of an example? Oh, well, the whole people-pleasing thing is a way of trying to get my needs met yeah. apart from God. Yeah, so all of these strategies that we've been talking about are based really on the premise that I don't need God, I can get my needs met apart from God. So um, let's have a look at that second means that is co contributed <coughs> to our <coughs> thinking, and that is the observation of others. So what happens is that um, we receive parent messages as we are growing up, and you can see from the picture there the message that that little guy is receiving. Where um, did you put my cigarettes? <laughs> <laughs> and parent messages 
are not just necessarily from parents, but from significant others like teachers, perhaps um, aunts, uncles, grandparents. They, as we're growing up, we're receiving messages all the time and input from uh, the people around us. And it's communicating things like values and attitudes. Um, which we just absorb unconsciously the values that have been inculcated probably into our parents as well and then are being passed on to us. So um, one of the um, things that happened to me when I was young was I had a very clever older brother who was extremely academic and always top of the class and always straight A's and I wasn't like that at all. And my parents inadvertently <coughs> didn't meant this to happen. The message that was constantly being said was, it's important and to be clever, and cleverness is a great value. Mm -hmm. And people who are clever are highly valued and important. Um, and one day, I was about 12, I think, I overheard my mom having a telephone conversation with some friend they hadn't seen for some time. And I heard her say, oh, yeah, I know he's doing brilliantly, he's top of the class, and um, yeah, I know he's, he's um, just absolutely flying, I'm so proud of him. And then I heard her say, oh, no, she's, she's, she's fine, she's just average, you know, just an ordinary sort of And she was talking about me. So that reinforced that, and it um, sent the message, <coughs> being clever is the important, I'm not very clever, I'm not very important. Mm -hmm. And so that was something that was going on in my head all the time, I'm just average. And maybe you can think of things that have perhaps been passed on values that have been passed on and parent messages and attitudes that have been communicated to you in your um, childhood and things that you've picked up. And none of us has had perfect parents. I mean, I have absolutely no doubt my mum loved me, absolutely. She didn't intend to wound me in that way, but it was just you know, um, and a, a, a thing that happened and, you know, so, um, so we don't have perfect parents, and in fact some of us have probably grown up in highly dysfunctional and perhaps even abusive homes, where there was a high degree of neglect or even outright abuse, and of course those messages that are being sent are very dis destructive, and we end up believing all kinds of beliefs that are actually not true. Our minds become darkened, and often we have a core belief, a belief <coughs> deep down inside that is negative about ourselves. And my belief was, I'm average, I'm not important. So, and those are painful. It's painful having an, a belief like that. It's painful believing that you, you're not someone of value. Um, then the third thing, the third factor that contributes to foolish thinking is our interpretation of hurts and traumas. And as it says their children are good observers but poor interpreters of events. And I'm sure some of you might know that, that children are extremely <coughs> observant but often when it comes to interpreting what they are observing, they go astray. For instance, a child whose parents are divorcing will often come to the conclusion, it's my fault, mommy and daddy are divorcing. You know, which is totally irrational, but they will believe that it's their fault that their parents are divorcing. Um, so in areas where there's abuse, where there's rejection, where there's neglect, those traumas and things um, get carried into the beliefs that we and that we um, adopt out of those painful events and traumas um, go into adulthood and we have these wrong patterns of thinking and these wrong beliefs that come out of that. So, uh, maybe we're talking about where our distorted thinking comes from. So firstly there's the fall, and of course we live in this world and the world has adopted 
exactly what Adam and Eve adopted that God is kind of holding out on us. And therefore we need to try and meet our own needs. Um, and then secondly, the parent messages, you know, it's the, it's the four Bs. It's the bucks, beauty, brains, and brawn, isn't it? That give value to people. Does that make sense? And we see that all the time. It's not that people are saying, hey, this guy, you know, he's so clever, he's valuable. They treat him like he's so valuable because he got all these top grades. And the message is, there's only one person who comes top of the class. Everybody else, not only didn't come top of the class, but they have taken on board the message, I'm not as valuable as. Mm. It's not that we're all the same, we're not. There are some people more intelligent than others. There are people who can run faster than others. The, the, the distortion is that, therefore, you are more valuable. Does that make sense? Mm. And we take that on board all the time. Building up a picture. We, as we grow up, we're asking the question, who am I? We get the answer from those significant people around about us. We pick that up automatically, and they become core beliefs. And then those traumas that, that Andy was talking about. You know, I mean, typically, if somebody has been abused, it's a, it's a, it's a distortion, and it's, but it happens. So somebody who, particularly if they've been sexually abused, which is such a terrible th uh, thing to have happen, they grow up thinking that they are trash. Now, what happened to them was trash. What happened to them was wicked. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That was such a bad thing that happened to them. Somehow, they interpret that as, I'm bad. I'm trash. This is all I'm good for. It's a, it's a misinterpretation of, of that event, and that's what does happen. And so again, it's trying to pick up, what, what have I picked up, which is not God's value system. And so all of those experiences build up to a language that goes on in our brain. All of us have this language going on, unconscious again. So again, we want to give you tools to try and make it conscious. So you become aware of what you're saying to yourself. We, um, the different names given to these, sometimes they're called AUTS, automatic unconscious thoughts. They're automatic, so there will be a trigger, something happens, and it's an automatic thought. And it goes down a well-worn path in our brain. They talk about neurological pathways. They're habits of thinking. So if that event happens, this is the, the thought pattern that goes down my, in my brain. So or sometimes they're called NATS, negative automatic thoughts. Um, and they are habits of thinking. And the, the, the thing about them is they're unconscious. We don't even know that they're there. Mm. And, and so we want to give you some tools that will help you to identify them. So this this internal dialogue that goes on. And when that's there, it will affect how we feel. Just now Andy's going to be talking about what we call the ABC theory, where um, what we believe about an event affects how we feel. And if what you believe is distorted, then what you feel is going to be exaggerated and distorted. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So it's so important to know what it is that you're saying to yourself, that internal dialogue. And so this is just a list of some of the things that we might say to ourselves. One of the things, counselors often say to themselves, I should help everyone who needs it. Why isn't that, why is that a, why shouldn't we say that to ourselves? What's wrong with that? Not helping yourself. Not helping yourself. Not helping yourself, yeah. You can't help everybody. Well, that's the point. That's the point. You can't help everybody. And if you're saying, you, I should help everyone who needs it, I'm a Christian, I should help everybody that comes to me, if they're in need, then I'm going to be the Messiah to them. What's going to happen? You become good for nobody. You burn yourself out. The fact is, like I had to learn as a people pleaser, God, what are you calling me to? I also had to know, God, what are you not calling me to? Yeah. Does that make sense? And be clear about that. I cannot help everybody that needs it. Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. And, and that's in many different realms. So you'll never get to the end of the need. You know where you are. So, yeah. Uh, I'm inferior as a common. Psychologists tell us all of us suffer from, to some degree, 
from inferiority, and that's because of those uh, the criteria that the world at large uses to value other people. And we've adopted that criteria and applied it to ourselves. And we usually compare ourselves negatively. So if you've got lots of money, you're worth somebody, but you always have more than you. Does that make sense? So we all have that sense of superiority. What I have to work with is this one. It's terrible when things go wrong. Eh? Wow. It's terrible when things go wrong. What's wrong with that statement? Things are always going to go wrong. Don't trust the world of Bali, I'm not sure how it sure happens here as well. <laughs> Things go wrong. And is it terrible? No, it's not nice. Nobody likes it when your car breaks down or the gate motor won't work or power goes off. <clears throat> it's not terrible. God is still on his throne. He still loves me. He still has a plan. Does that make sense? And I, but if I'm saying it's terrible, and I do, I've had to, I've had to retrain myself, what I say to myself. Um, yeah, making a mistake is terrible. That's the perfectionist um, thing. And the, another one is I ought to do better, I ought to do better, I ought to do better. And uh, making a mistake is terrible. I'm a perfectionist. Well, you know, no one's perfect. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. And is it terrible to make a mistake? No. Mm -hmm. Actually, it can be great. You know, learning experience. What is that, that, that saying that says that the road to success is paved with failure? Is that right? Mm -hmm. I forget who said that, but that's the truth of the matter. Is that it's failure after failure after failure before we have success. Uh, I should never upset anyone. I think often Christians feel like that. Why is that not true? Because we're not perfect. We're not perfect. Jesus upset people, didn't he? Big time. So, and we are followers of him. So, we will upset people. Obviously, that doesn't give us license to say, well, I'm going to go around upsetting people. I'm going to make it my business. Obviously, does that make sense? So, what might the truth be? Well, I'm going to do the best I can to love God, be faithful to him, but I know that's going to upset some people. It does. Jesus told us it would. Isn't that so? And so on. So, these examples are things that we might say to ourselves and we need to change them. <clears throat> what about this? It's impossible to be happy with Mary as she is. What's wrong with that statement? That's a marriage. You can't change Mary. Can't change Mary. And yeah, you, you kind of, you're a victim. Nothing I can do. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's impossible to be happy. And what it's saying is my happiness depends on me. Does it? <laughs> my happiness depends on the Lord. Not very pleasant living with Mary. And there's things about Mary's behavior I don't like, but actually I can be happy, even though Mary's like she is. Does that make sense? <laughs> change what you say, and it'll change how you feel. Are you going to do the ABC now? Okay. So, how do we change this distorted thinking? Um, we want to give you a little bit of a tool. And the slide before that is the three R's. We want to give you the three R's. Recognize, reject, and replace are the three R's of changing your thinking. First of all, what you need to do is recognize when you are saying something that is distorted or wrong. Um, how do you recognize? Um, how do you recognize that something's not right inside? What's the easiest way of recognizing that all is not well within? Yeah. It's your emotion, isn't it? So the consequent emotion, this is a very handy little tip. A is the activating event, B is the belief about that event, and C is the consequent emotion. So we think that C is dependent on A, but actually it's really dependent on B, the belief that we uh, have about that event. So when I'm feeling a negative emotion, like let's say I'm feeling very anxious, that is a little warning flag that says, hmm, you're saying something to yourself, what are you believing that's making you feel anxious? So we can help ourselves to recognize our distorted thinking 
by tuning into our emotions. Anger, what am I saying to myself that's making me so angry? It's not what happened, it's what I'm saying to myself about what happened. And that <coughs> helps us to recognize. So when I go, we was going into exams, which would be the activating event, I would be feeling terribly anxious and jittery. What was I saying to myself? You're going to do bad. Sorry? You're going to do bad. Yeah. I'm average. I'm not very clever. I'm not going to do well. I'll probably fail or just get 50% scrape through. And I would be, and that's not okay because cleverness is what's really valuable. So that's not okay. And the consequent emotion would be this anxiety and panic. So there are three questions that we can uh, ask ourselves to help us get in touch with our distorted thinking. Uh, the three questions are, what am I feeling? Anxious. What happened? Oh, well, this exam's looming. What am I saying to myself? I'm saying to myself, I'm not very really bright. I'm just average. I won't do well. And then I have to go back to the three R's. No. Recognize. I'm saying that thing to myself again. Reject it. It's not true. It's not true that it's not okay to be average. It's actually fine to be average. I mean, it might be true. I am average. I mean, God loves average people. He made so many of them. <laughs> <laughs> and what I need to say to myself is, I have just as much intelligence that I need to do what God has called me to do. Isn't that so? He made me. He gave, gave me a certain level of intelligence. And he's called me to do certain works that he prepared beforehand for me to do. So he must have made me to do those things. So I'm fine. If I only do averagely in this exam, it's okay. I've worked hard. It's not that I've scarred off. I've worked really hard. I've studied. I've done my best. That's all that God expects of me is my best. And then what do I feel? I feel so much better, don't I? If you change your thinking, you change your emotions. It has a direct impact on how you feel. And my thinking is no longer distorted. I feel much more relaxed. I'm much more confident in myself. I'm much more easy in my own skin. I don't mind being average. It's actually okay. I'm fine with that. I don't have to be brilliant like my brother. I can just be me and accept that God has made me fearfully and wonderfully for who I am meant to be. And so my thinking just, all those distortions go out. Now obviously it's again a process and you have to work at it. Um, so recognize, reject, replace. And we do that over and over again. Recognize, ah, I'm feeling so angry. What am I saying to myself? I'm saying, that woman ought to drive properly. There we go, those oughts, the oughts, the shoulds, and the must. Okay, and I'd say, yes, maybe she ought to drive properly, but she's not driving properly, and I can't control her behavior, and I just need to look after my driving. And the anger subsides, and the thinking become straightened. So it's, you can do this all through your day. Recognize, reject, replace. Try and get in touch with those distorted th thoughts and replace them with God's truth. Scripture. Scripture is so powerful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To um, bring in the truth. His word is truth. When we al align our thinking with his truth, then we start to live our lives the way we should. We begin to see ourselves the way we should and we begin to see others the way we should, and just so much gets straightened out when our thinking is um, the Lord's truth that we're thinking. Basically to say, yeah, we, we've talked today, just quickly summarise, uh, our, our thinking gets distorted, one, because of the fall, two, because of our observation of others, three, because of our interpretation of traumatic events, um, and that we have this language going on in our head, we call them oughts or nats, we call them oughts, automatic unconscious thoughts, and a way of getting in touch with them is the ABC. If you have that negative emotions, to say what's the event that triggers that emotion, what am I saying to myself about that event? 
and is it true? Now, sometimes the things we say to ourselves about the bed is true. Well, then you have to process the emotion. Some things are sad. Some things should make us angry. Some things do cause concern. Guilt is a good, healthy emotion that brings us back in line with God. Is that right? Does that make sense? So sometimes the things we say to ourselves is true, but very often it's not. It's distorted, and therefore the emotion that we feel is exaggerated or unnecessary altogether. And in those cases, we need to recognize that we're saying the wrong thing to ourselves, reject it forcibly, and replace it. And the thing is, we will not change our thinking except we work at it. You know what? This is what spiritual warfare is about. Mm. Isn't that so? We have, um, and I'll, I didn't bring my Bible, which is it's in, in 1 Corinthians 10, I don't know if Nathan can quote it for us. <laughs> <laughs> the 2 Corinthians 10, it says, uh, the, the um, weapons that we have have divine power. Does that make sense? And it says something about uh, bringing our every thought captive and making it obedient to Jesus. Do you, do you know that scripture? There it is. There it is. There, we did, there it is. The weapons that we fight with have divine power. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against God and mm -hmm. take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus. That's what we're talking about. It's a spiritual battle. And Satan is the father of lies, isn't he? Mm -hmm. He is the deceiver of the brethren. He will do everything he can to make sure that we believe, continue believing the lies. And this is what we need to do. Say, hang on, I'm not, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to believe what he says. I'm going to reject it. I'm going to take on board what the Lord says. And that takes time, folks. This neurological pathway, this habit of thinking, takes time to get a new path that says, I'm not uh, second rate because I'm not top of the class. Mm -hmm. To get to the stage, I am incredibly valuable because Jesus says so. Mm -hmm. That takes time to work. You've got to recognize that you're saying the old thing, reject it, replace it. Recognize, reject, replace it. Until you have a new habit of thinking. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It will take time. It is a work. But if you persevere, um, and that we're going to work these things through as we talk about anxiety, as we talk about depression, we talk about anger, and work out through the kind of common things we would say to ourselves in each of those uh, problem areas. Good, we've run out of time, I'm afraid. Any comments or questions before we close? Just one yes. on the, um, with the same kind of pattern of dealing with the issue we apply to something which is a phobia, so like an irrational yeah. response to some situation. Yeah. The same. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so we get into like negative loops, what they call negative loop, and you can change it to try a positive loop. So like a phobia would be things that you're saying to yourself which are not true, um, or exaggerated. Um, so for example, you know, again, an interpretation of a trauma, I might have an accident, and then in my thinking, it's all just one, I say, every time I get in that car, I have an accident. That's a distortion. Does that make sense? And I'm thinking that, and therefore I avoid, which empowers the fear, makes me even more afraid. And so that's a negative loop to how the thinking <coughs> is reinforced by the behavior and the emotion. If I want to change that, I need to go to the Lord and know where my security lies and know what he says about that. So I begin to change what I think about that event. And because he is in control, I'm going to try and do the very thing I'm petrified of doing. They say, do it afraid. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard that expression. You do it anyway. Um, but as you do it, you realize that actually it was okay. And you begin to feel good. It disempowers the fear. So it's a point, it becomes a positive loop. So the, these, all these things work together. So what's happening in your emotion, of course, in your physical as well. When you're very anxious, when you have a phobia, it tells in your body. You have a fight or flight thing going on. Your breathing goes up, your blood pressure goes up, your sweat. All of it's happening in your body, you know it's there. It affects your emotions. It affects your behavior. Very often you think, I'm not going to do that, you know, whatever. I'm never going to go in that car again. 
and, and you're thinking, this thing is terrible. The chances of me having an accident are 95%, but actually it's probably about 45%. And really, this is where the key is. I'm safe in the Lord. Therefore, I can change my thinking. Therefore, I change my behavior. I'm going to go and do that every day. That will change how I feel. Change what happens in the body. Does that make sense? <coughs> Yeah, yes. I have a question, but it doesn't have to be answered. Um, earlier you mentioned if someone's swearing, an elder could go and say, hey, I recognize this behavior. Oh, um, are you aware of it? And you spoke about like you have to be recognized the thing. And um, this whole process, if you're walking it with someone else, it's a very like um, combined thing, them, not you doing it for them. What? How should you look at it if there's someone in your life that you can recognize obvious unhealthy patterns, but they haven't invited you into a conversation about it. If it's like a family member or a friend or... <coughs> yeah, this is a tricky one. Uh, let me do the easy part first. Um, if they are engaging in obviously sinful behavior and they're in the church, then I think you have every reason to come alongside them. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm thinking of non-Christians. Yeah. yeah, so I think it's a little bit tricky there. Mm. You know, then you need God's wisdom to know. Mm. You know, I think that scripture in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6 where Paul says, if they're in the world, well, they're in the world. Mm -hmm. But if they're in the church, then you need to do something about it. Mm -hmm. You need to judge them in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, a question uh, I want to just ask. What cause for people to be important? To be hypocrites. Hypocrites. What do you, do you what do you think? Well, what's a hypocrite? What push people to be hypocrites? So, uh, you know, Jesus said they they like whitewashed tombs, aren't they? Nice and clean on the outside, and dead and rotten on the inside. Is that right? Why do they do that? Why might they do that? What are they looking? What's the goal that they're trying to achieve? Maybe they, they want to look good. They measure up, yeah. Yeah, they, you know, either uh, want to look good in, 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 in the community. You know, Could Jesus, it, sorry, yeah. like a projection, so they don't want to deal with their own stuff, so they'll project yeah. onto others. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what they're looking for is the approval of men, isn't it? They're looking for, they want to be loved, they want to be affirmed. Nothing wrong with the need, it's how they're going about it. They're looking for the approval of men instead of looking for the approval of God. Does that make sense? Mm. Yes. Again, can I just also uh, add maybe a perspective to that? And I just, um, I know often in the church because we often create an environment which um, I think we all kind of like externally trying to put our best foot forward in the mm. church context. Um, and we create an environment where when we come into church, you know, because we're in church now, we're all trying to put our best foot forward. And I think sometimes, and, and sometimes we can create an environment in church where we're not really very vulnerable ourselves. You know, none of us want to be vulnerable about our difficult stuff. So we're all putting our best foot forward and creating almost like a false impression of because there's a lack of vulnerability. So I'm just kind of saying, I think sometimes in church we actually create environments which are not vulnerable, which are open to a hypocritical kind of. Yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we tend, we, it is easy to fall into the trap of pretending in a, in a way. Mm. Isn't that so? Mm. So, you know, we can be on the way. I mean, this would never happen to us, but <laughs> we're on the way to church and have a Charlie Rao. So I don't know what's happened, you know, because <laughs> I took that slide out. <laughs> <laughs> and then we arrive at church and, hi, <laughs> uh, in the car again, well, well that's <laughs> yeah, so, um, and the, the thing about being vulnerable is that actually um, it's, it's being real, isn't that so? I mean, I don't think, no one is saying that it, it, gives, it gives you permission to behave as you like. It's just saying, hey, um, this is me, this is what I'm backing with. Uh, this is what's happening, and I'm trying to do it this way, mm. but failing. That gives permission to others to 
we had an incident where one uh, someone at the church um, was daring incredibly vulnerable about talking about their addiction to pornography and um, and what that had led to. The interesting thing about this was is just that out of that, and he spoke public in the, in the church, and um, out of that, it was just like all this need popped up. Mm. You know, pornography was very secret back, isn't it? Mm. And uh, but this kind of gave permission for people to say, well, you know what? I'm also battling with it. I'm also battling with this. Please help. I'm trapped. You know, kind of. Does that make sense? Mm. So I think the vulnerability. Is, is saying, hey, this is where I've gone wrong. Not that it gives permission for that, but it's, it, this is where I've fallen and I'm really trying to do the right thing. And it kind of gives permission for other people to be real as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Should we pray? Father, we thank you for uh, who you are. And I want to pray that you'd help us, Lord, to be able to understand and solve understand ourselves using these principles um, and you know, to work them through but also Lord that you would equip us to be able to help others as well mm -hmm. thank Lord Jesus of these um, unconscious goals that we have of trying to meet our needs apart from you we say forgive us we pray forgive mm -hmm. us Lord for um, cutting you out of it Lord or, or believing somehow that you can't meet our needs Lord, we want to repent of that and be vulnerable before you. Just lay ourselves at your feet and say, Lord, please give us what we need to pray. Mm -hmm. And then, Lord, that we can then, out of that fullness, out of that wholeness, then be able to behave as you want us to behave. And in our thinking, Lord, which is so deeply entrenched in us, we pray that you'd show us where our thinking has become distorted or playing wrong. Mm -hmm. And that we would believe the lies of the devil. And I pray, Father God, you'd show us the truth. Help us to grasp it, Lord, and think differently. Mm. We pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. 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 Good. Lord bless. Thank you.